Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Oklahomans know all too well how quickly disaster can strike. So as part of Emergency Preparedness Month, we're looking at some of the resources available to you through OSU Extension. But first, SUNUP's Curtis Hare is talking with the coordinator of the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network about upcoming sale dates for this popular value-added program. Well, fall's the time of the year when we're starting to think about the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network, and we're here with our OQBN coordinator, Jeff Roby. And Jeff, what are some things that producers need to think about if they're wanting to take part in this program? Well, the weaning dates uh, for the sales are coming up quickly. Um, we've already uh, passed one set of weaning dates for uh, a sale at McAllister here uh, in September. Uh, but producers that want to participate in the program, uh, they need to start thinking about getting those calves weaned. Um, start thinking about um, nutrition programs, you know, how much weight do you want them to gain and start calculating uh, how much feed that's going to take uh, to get to that goal um, at a 45 or 60 day preconditioning period. So for that preconditioning period, and you know, we're always talking about, we, we've been covering the OQBM program for a long time for SUNUP, but let's just you know, kind of walk over, you know, the benefits of taking part in, you know, the VAC 45 program. The benefits um, to preconditioning, uh, there's lots of research out there that, that show the benefits. Uh, one of the benefits is, is reduced shrink uh, at, at sale time. Um, calves that have been preconditioned, um, they'll experience less shrink um, than non-preconditioned calves. Um, the sale time, you know, that's one of the big benefits of the program that, that producers, um, that tends to get overlooked is that these calves are going to sell typically at noon on sale day, so producers don't have to sit around all day and wonder, you know, when those calves are going to sell. And then that goes back to that shrink, you know, those calves aren't going to sit in that sale barn all day to maybe experience more shrink than they need to. And you're giving buyers, you know, you know, quality for what they're paying for. Absolutely. They recognize that value um, in, in purchasing preconditioned calves because those are the things that they're probably going to do to those animals but they're already done and they recognize that value. Um, the, you know the, the seller is going to see added weight at, at sale time versus if they were just to wean them right off of mom and sell them you know in October. Um, they're also going to see that pre seasonal price swing um, that comes along that, 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 that happens between October and November usually. And you know, I mentioned buyers getting what they pay for, but for the producers who are wanting to participate in OQBN, you know, you know the benefits of premiums of having premiums to sell their cattle. On average, producers see about eleven dollars per hundred weight uh, on those preconditioned animals versus non-preconditioned. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the number one question that every producer asks: is, is what is it going to cost me, and how much am I going to make? So, um, it's held pretty steady. And you have a lot of resources, you know, not just you know information on. Um, you know, premiums, but also information on vaccine requirements in regards to OKBN that, that people can access if they're interested. Right. All of that stuff um, is on our website. Uh, they can go there and they can see uh, program requirements, uh, the different options that they can select from uh, when choosing their health protocol when they administer those vaccines, a list of all the approved vaccines. So there's all kinds of information about the program that they can find on the website. All righty. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff Roby, OQBN coordinator here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like a link to the website he mentioned, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, Wesley here with the weekly Mesonet weather report. September is usually one of the wetter months of the year for Oklahoma. However, this year it has been towards the drier end of the scale. You can see this on the map how the lack of rainfall over the past week has impacted soil moisture levels in the state. All the browns on this weekly change in the 10 inch fractional water index indicate a drying of soil moisture. Very little green is shown, which indicates soil moisture levels improving. Our 4-inch fractional water map indicates moisture levels needed for proper seed germination. As of midweek, most of the areas outside of southeast Oklahoma were running at 0.2 or less. On this scale, zero is as dry as a sensor can read and one is as wet as it can read at that particular depth. Point one or two tells us that the soil is very dry. 
Looking at our deepest sensor, which is 24 inches, the moisture map still shows very dry conditions for most of the traditional areas wheat and canola is planted. Very little improvement is expected in that area of the state when looking at the lower than normal rainfall chances over next week, according to the National Weather Center forecast. Gary is up next with a drought map starting to look pretty ugly. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. And what a wonderful last month we've been having as Mother Nature's made us pay for that cool start to the summer. We've had about a straight month of abnormally hot, abnormally dry conditions, and unfortunately that's had an impact on the drought. Let's take a look at the newest drought monitor map and see where we're at. Unfortunately, it's an explosion of color. Those yellows are abnormally dry conditions, or D0, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. These are areas that are in danger of going into drought if we don't get rainfall soon. And of course, the tan areas are moderate to severe drought. We see those areas across east central, northeastern, and northwestern Oklahoma, and the far western panhandle. Obviously, if we don't see good rain soon, we're going to see a lot more of that tan color as the abnormally dry conditions transform into drought conditions. That's definitely showing up in the soils. We see the topsoil moisture from the USDA. Uh, this is percent short to very short. 60% of the Oklahoma soils are now considered uh, short to very short of moisture. That's topsoil, so uh, definitely had an impact on our topsoils. Take a look at the rainfall over the last 60 days from the Oklahoma Mesnet. Well, we do see some good areas. Those uh, darker reds show up, just blotches across the state and much of the far southeastern corner, a little bit of a central Oklahoma, but we see, see way too many of those uh, darker to lighter green colors. Those are areas that have only received one to three inches of rainfall. Looking at it another way, consecutive days with less than a quarter inch of rainfall on any single day. This is from the Oklahoma Mesnet. We can see Tulsa has had as many as 65 consecutive days without at least a quarter inch of rain in one single day. Those other areas in the red and orange are a similar, greater than a month, more or less. So um, that's just a different way to look at the dryness we've seen over the last month or so. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're joined now by Dr. Amy Hagerman, our Extension Ag Policy Specialist, but today we're not talking policy topics. We're talking about how to be prepared in case a disaster strikes. Amy, get us up to speed. Absolutely. So September is National Emergency Preparedness Month, and this is just a great time to remind ourselves of the small and the big steps we can take to be more prepared in case an emergency or a disaster strikes. And we're very familiar with those kinds of situations here in Oklahoma. And, you know, I'm sure in those situations people feel really helpless, but if you could do some planning and preparation now, that's the key. Let's kind of start with your, your kind of personal situation, your home and, and that part of it. Yeah, it's just like when you're on an airplane and they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before you help somebody else. The reason for that is that when you're prepared, when you're breathing normally, you can better help others in your community, you can better help others in your family. So it's always a great place to start with just your emergency preparedness. Have you thought through the what if scenarios for your own home? What if we have another ice storm and the power goes out again? Have you thought about simple things like, do I have a flashlight handy? Does it have batteries? If we have a heavy windstorm come through and you wanna go out and check the damage to your roof or if a tree falls down. Another thing is having that go bag somewhere near your door. Uh, we also can't stop thinking about tornadoes here in Oklahoma, even in the fall, medications. We can't forget about those critical medications. If you've got little kids at home, do you have diapers and formula and things like that? And then also thinking more broadly outside of our homes personally, I think I especially think about my kids. If something happened here in town and we were separated, do they have that phone number for somebody they can call that is our central point of coordination? And I think it's good to talk those things over with kids in advance. They kind of file it away, but they, they have that reference point if they need it. Let's talk about, uh, for business owners, some of the preparation tips there. Just like we think about our home, we have to think about our business, but then we have additional issues like do you have a phone tree for your employees in your office that they know who to call if something happens to them or they knew who to, who to call to check in on everybody else in the office. Backing up critical files 
for the office. The last thing you want is severe water or fire or wind damage in your office. And no doubt some of that translates to the farm and ranch too, but what are some specific concerns for, for producers and landowners? I, weather obviously affects everything we do in farming and ranching. So when you have a severe weather event, um, it's obviously going to affect everything from your crops to your livestock to your hay, uh, your buildings. So thinking through things for specific kinds of natural disasters is really important. We saw flooding in 2019 that, you know, individuals were really scrambling to try to get cattle onto high ground. Thinking about that ahead of time, do I have flood prone land? And what would I do if it looked like the waters were rising? Have I talked to my neighbors about whether I could drop the fence? So OSU Extension has a web website for emergency and disaster preparedness that includes things like how to pack an emergency kit for your home. Also, ready.gov has a lot of great checklists that you can go through to just think through some of these different scenarios. And there are some great farm and ranch preparedness websites through Extension Services and the Extension Foundation. Okay, great information, Amy, thanks a lot. And for a link to the resources that Amy mentioned, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. Uh, this week, we begin really several weeks of talking about managing the cow herd at weaning time. But as we gather cows and wean calves and go through that process in the fall, it is typically a good time to take a look at certain things or some specific management practices on the cow herd. And we're gonna talk about some of the information we wanna collect this week and in weeks to come, we're gonna talk about taking a look at that information and some standard performance analysis that we could look at that indicates cow herd productivity. The first one is if possible, right now, it's a good idea to preg check our cows. Um, obviously, if we've got cows that come up open, we need some kind of a plan for those. Maybe it is to market or liquidate those cows, uh, but also just to take a look at stage of pregnancy and see if our cows are getting bred in a timely fashion. Another thing that it's a good idea to collect at this time of year, if possible, is just a weight on those cows. Obviously, that sheer mass of the cow is gonna impact what she's gonna to need to eat, and whether it's standing forage that we're gonna be grazing, or we're putting together or buying our hay crop uh, for going through the winter months, it's beneficial to us to know how big those cows actually are. Another good idea at this time of year is just to, if we don't have individual ID or ear tags in those cows, and cows will lose those through the course of the production cycle, it's a good idea to update that, maybe get a new ear tag put in them, maybe to put an ID tag in them for the first time if we haven't already. Uh, I feel like each cow should be looked at on an individual basis and evaluated for soundness of a variety of things. We need to be taking a look at that cow's udder, her eyes, her mouth, her feet and legs, and assessing things that help to determine if she is worth keeping around and taking to that next calving season and if she's gonna be capable of doing that for us again the next year. Another good idea as we're weaning off calves, as we look at those cows individually, is less assess a body condition score. Typically, we say we'd like for our mature cow herd to be a body condition score five and a half to six at the time of calving. We expect that this time of year, as we're weaning off calves, that those cows are gonna be milked down and probably at their thinnest point of the year. So we can do a little target feeding on those cows because once they're dry, it is a more cost-effective time to be putting a little flesh or condition back on them going into the next calving season. Final thing that it's a good idea to take a look at right now as we wean off those calves is herd health. Those cows are going to need boosters, probably deworming. Uh, as we've referred to before in cow-calf corner segments, consult with your local vet, put together a herd health program that works for you and meets your specific goals. As I said earlier, 
If we can collect this kind of information, as well as just basic inventories of cattle throughout the year, we're going to start taking a look at that in weeks to come uh, in some ways that, that indicate management, maybe some things we can do better, but an overall picture of just cow herd productivity and performance. I appreciate you joining us this week. Look forward to seeing you next week on Cow Calf Corner. Well, it's that time of the show where we check in with our crop marketing specialist, Dr. Kim Anderson. So Kim, talking markets, let's start with wheat. What's going on? Well, wheat prices have been on a, a, a light a downtrend or downtrend lights, what I'd call it probably. Uh, they were up at 685 at the beginning of the month. They went down to 645, back up to around, oh, 6. 65 now, so right midterm. The northern hemisphere harvest is essentially done. Canadian wheat crop, they lowered that this week. Russian wheat crop, there's still a lot of talk about that. USDA's got it at uh, 2.66 billion. A report came out this week, it may be lower, but the Ukraine crop makes up for part of that. 1.2 billion bushel crop, that's a near record there. It was 934 million last year. So black sea production though, overall, is about 300 uh, million bushels below last year. But Australia and Argentina, you add them together, 1.86 billion bushels, 1.46 last year. So that's 400 million. So we've got a record world production coming up. And the Australian Argentine, which will come on later in the year, should offset the losses we've had in the Northern Hemisphere. So volatility a lot with the wheat markets of what we've been seeing pretty much all, all summer. But some of that volatility reached corn last week, as you mentioned. So is that still continuing? The corn and wheat uh, prices have both been volatile. Uh, we've probably got about 10% of the corn crop harvested. No surprises there. Uh, the New Orleans grain facilities that were shut down, they're pretty much back in the operation. We're looking at a 15 billion bushel near record corn crop there. World production at uh, 47.2 billion, that is a record. But both world and U.S. any stocks this year are projected to be higher. So that signalized slightly lower prices, but yet U.S. corn stocks are still projected to be below average. So are sorghum prices still higher than corn? Uh, only about 10 cents. You go to this time last year, sorghum prices were $1.60 higher than corn prices. And what's going on there? China. China was in buying sorghum last year. They're not buying sorghum this year. So soybeans, they've been looking so great, but you know, they were starting a downtrend, but have they, do you think they've hit bottom? Uh, they may be close to bottom. Uh, they went from over $14 down to below 12 for a while. Uh, they've dropped 50 cents in the, in the last week or so from uh, 12.50 down to uh, 12.10. That's 40 cents if my math's right there. I think they've got a sideways pattern going on right now. So uh, China is just, uh, well, they canceled two cargoes this last week or uh, quite a bit of soybean purchases. And that, of course, has negative impact on prices. And, you know, lastly, cotton, our cotton producers, what's going on with cotton? Oh, cotton prices are good. you got cotton prices up around 93 cents. So walling around between 92 and 95, cotton prices are good. And, and most analysts think cotton prices will hold this level. And we just got to pray for rain. And we'll get some rain. All right, thanks, Kim. Dr. Kim Anderson, Crop Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Today, I thought I'd share a little bit of information about fermented foods. There are many different types of fermented foods, some that you might find obvious, such as beer or wine, some that you might not be aware of, such as tempeh or natto, and some that you may never have thought about, such as pickles or cheese. While there's no official definition for what constitutes a fermented food, a good general definition would be any food or beverage produced through controlled microbial growth. However, this leads to the question, why do we ferment food? The first reason is that fermented foods can be quite flavorful with distinct tart or sour notes and a fizzy mouthfeel. This is due to the acid and or alcohol that is produced by microorganisms as they metabolize carbohydrates that are present in the food. For example, yogurt has a rich tangy flavor that is produced by the fermentation of sugar present in milk. Another reason that we ferment foods is nutrition. Fermented foods such as miso, kefir, and kombucha can be sources of probiotics, which are living microorganisms that are crucial to good digestion and may have additional health benefits. For example, the final reason that we ferment foods is preservation. One way that fermentation accomplishes this is by increasing the concentration of acid in a food 
by controlled microbial growth, which in turn lowers the pH, making the food inhospitable to spoilage microorganisms. So feel free to go out and enjoy some fermented foods for whatever reason. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or food.okstate.edu. A quick reminder about the upcoming peanut and cotton field tour. This event will be held at the Caddo County Research Station in Fort Cobb this Thursday, September 23rd. For more information about this field tour, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Dr. Amanda Silva, our OSU Extension Small Grain Specialist, joins us now. Amanda, it's wheat planting time. I think this is an exciting time of year. Let's just give folks an overview of, of what producers are facing as they prepare to put seed into the ground. Yeah, so the weather, I mean, no doubt about it, it has been very dry. I've been talking to some producers and we are just hoping for a rain. Uh, we are right now at that optimum planting window for dual purpose. And as we kind of start getting out of that window, uh, our forage yield prospects starts to, to decrease. So the plan is hopefully we'll get a rain real soon and we can plant. And if not, uh, we are just gonna go ahead and dust it in. Let's talk about the optimal dates. Uh, you mentioned dual purpose, but as we kind of look forward to uh, the rest of September and into October, what are those time frames? Yeah, so mid-September, uh, mid it's the, the optimum time for planting dual purpose because that is the time where we can maximize forage production while minimizing yield losses. But for producers that are in a grain-only uh, system, uh, mid-October, so three, four weeks after that optimum window for dual purpose, so mid-October would be the optimum time, a general optimum time for Oklahoma grain-only producers. What about seeding rates? Seeding rate, our recommendation is uh, for grain only 60 pounds per acre uh, has demonstrated to be uh, good in our wheat plots. And if in a dual purpose uh, situation, doubling that to 100, 120 pounds per acre in most regions of Oklahoma has demonstrated to increase forage production. And then in terms of variety selections, some people are still kind of making those decisions. Uh, what guidance do you have there? Yeah, and uh, so for dual purpose uh, producers, one thing that I, I really like to remind is that fall forage yield is very important, of course, but even more important than that, it's how uh, a variety can withstand that grazing. And so what is the yield potential of that variety being after being grazed? So the recovery potential of the variety, and we just know that when we, we, we watch those varieties in, in our, for example, in our dual purpose trials and one of our cooperators uh, at Walters at um, El Reno, so we, we can see that how some varieties, they do produce a lot of forage, but then when they're grazed, they just cannot recover that well. It's still not too late to get a, get a soil test and, and make some decisions based on, on the outcome of that. Yeah, especially for uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, getting those soil samples is, is very important, especially this year with, with the costs of fertilizer. So very important controlling that volunteer weed because that uh, act in also uh, grassy weeds, they host the weed chromite with, which transmit virus diseases. And last but not least, once the wheat starts sprouting, keeping an eye out for fall armyworms, right? Yes, yes, so we are hearing reports, they're everywhere, and monitoring very close will be very important. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Silva. For a link to the resources that she mentioned, go to sunup.okstate.edu. You may have heard that pollinators are declining in numbers, and it's important to think about ways to conserve this vital group of organisms. Pollinators comprise anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 species of animal, and they're responsible for the reproduction and pollination of over 250,000 species of flowering plants. 
So when you think about ways of helping pollinators, we're thinking about conservation practices. And there's a number of things that we can do. And essentially there's a two-pronged approach. Uh, one deals with uh, the effective but also judicious use of insecticides and other pesticides. And the other is uh, land conservation. With insecticide use, we want to either reduce the amount that we're using or the frequency of application. The other method is to set aside uh, certain portions of land uh, to uh, convert that land into pollinator habitat. For instance, the federal government has a couple of programs like the Conservation Enhancement Program, uh, the Conservation Resource Program. Uh, there's a few, other that, a few others that agricultural producers can tap into uh, that the government will pay subsidies to convert that land from production uh, landscape into pollinator landscape. So some simple practices include providing uh, these flowering resources for pollinators um, by planting them in different arrays. Uh, one method, for instance, is to plant hedgerows. Uh, so, so these are larger plants that, um, uh, that, that produce flowers. Uh, others would be maybe planting flowering strips uh, in between rows or maybe planting the outside border of that, uh, of that agricultural area in flowering plants. For more information about these federal programs to enhance pollinator habitat, you can visit the SUNUP webpage at sunup.okstate.edu for more information. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.